Anglicans, Mennonites, Quakers, and Methodists. What's the difference? Well, you might think that we'd start right in with talking about the beliefs of these groups, but give me one minute to talk about the origin, because it's important to understanding them. The Church of England was for a long time just the Catholic Church in England, and they accepted the Pope's authority. But in the 1500s, due to political issues, they were separated, and suddenly Catholic bishops became Anglican bishops, and Catholic churches became Anglican churches. From England, Anglicanism has spread all over the world. Most Anglicans in America are called Episcopalians. Mennonites came from a group called the Anabaptists. Anabaptists were so called because they didn't accept infant baptism, but instead baptized people after they were old enough to make a profession of faith. A former Catholic priest named Menno Simons gained influence in the group, and those Anabaptists who followed his brand of theology became known as Mennonites. Quakers find their origin in a break from the Church of England in the 1600s. There were several groups who were separating at that time from the Anglicans, and these were called nonconformists. Quakers, who found their beginnings in the teachings of one George Fox, were just one of these. Officially, they are the Society of Friends, but when Fox was called before magistrates on a charge of blasphemy, he said that, I bid them quake at the word of the Lord, and this apparently caused them to begin to be called Quakers. Methodists also originated in the Church of England. Anglican minister John Wesley, his brother Charles, and friend George Whitfield were branded as Methodists by their fellow students at Oxford, and they taught the necessity of a salvation experience and holy living. Though not seeking to start a new denomination so much as to revive the Anglicans, ultimately Methodist societies became churches, and they would come to have different theology too than the Anglicans they originated from. Now, let's look at what makes these denominations the same and what makes them different. Unlike the Catholic Church, none of these officially have seven sacraments, but of the four, the Anglicans are the closest to that. If you're looking for some historical documents that tell what Anglicans believe and practice, the answer is to look at the Book of Common Prayer and the 39 Articles of Religion. And guess what one of the articles says? There are two sacraments ordained of Christ our Lord in the Gospel, that is to say, baptism and the Supper of the Lord. Those five commonly called sacraments, that is to say, confirmation, penance, orders, matrimony, and extreme unction, are not to be counted for sacraments of the gospel, being such as have grown partly of the corrupt following of the apostles, but yet have not like nature of sacraments with baptism and the Lord's Supper, for that they have not any visible sign or ceremony ordained of God. The 39 articles are not held to as an inviolable creed, though, and so today the reality is that a bunch of Anglicans say, Oh, the other five aren't sacraments of the gospel, but they are sacraments of the church. So it's pretty common today to refer to seven sacraments in the Anglican church. For Mennonites, they sometimes refer to ordinances instead of sacraments. And perhaps surprisingly, Mennonite history also provides us with the number seven, if just for a short moment. Most Mennonites have held to only two or three ordinances, but in the early decades of the 1900s, there was a movement to refer to seven, baptism, communion, foot washing, prayer veiling for women, anointing with oil, the kiss of charity, and marriage. This wasn't original Mennonite teaching, though, and today most have went back to just two or three, the two being baptism and the Lord's Supper, and the possible third being foot washing. Quakers have a theology of the inner light, a direct awareness of God in everyone, and tend to say things like, every day is a sacrament, every moment is an encounter with the sacred. But as for physical sacraments, in most cases they aren't practiced at all. No water baptism, no bread or cup for the Lord's Supper. Among evangelical Quakers especially, there have been more exceptions, so today it's not uncommon to hear of baptism in the Lord's Supper as being sacraments in their churches, but in most cases there are no practices of sacraments. However, Quakers are quick to tell you that they don't deny sacraments, they just don't believe that rituals are needed to access sacramental power. For Methodists, it's pretty consistently two sacraments, baptism and the Lord's Supper. It's also worth discussing how the sacraments are performed and viewed. Anglicans most commonly baptize by pouring, although other modes are viewed as valid. Infants are baptized. Mennonites have also used different modes, but pouring is also most common here, followed by immersion. And there's only believer's baptism. Quakers have no physical mode of baptism, and Methodists tend to use pouring or sprinkling, but sometimes immerse, and infants are normally baptized with some exceptions. Anglicans generally affirm the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist. There's a range here, though. At one end, they nearly reach a Catholic view, with some Anglo-Catholic types even doing Eucharistic adoration. And at the other end, some hold a more spiritual presence type of view. Mennonites hold a symbolic view of the elements of communion, 
and Quakers don't use elements at all. Christ is just as present at all times. Remember, life is a sacrament. Methodists, following their Anglican heritage, mostly affirm the real presence. Now let's discuss worship style. This is one area in which most denomination traditions have tended to broaden into allowing different types, and to some extent, all of these traditions reflect that. However, generally, we can say that Anglicans have a liturgical style, often with processions, use of an organ, lectionary, readings, and standard order of service in a church year. They normally have weekly communion. Mennonites are much less liturgical, with their services being often quite simple. More conservative groups don't use instruments at all. Some only celebrate communion once or twice a year, others quarterly or monthly. Quaker services are different still. Many Quakers have at least a portion of the service as unprogrammed worship. This means that there's no plan. People sit in silence until someone feels led to do something. Maybe they will lead in a song or sing one alone. Maybe a short word of encouragement or a prayer. In some cases, everyone will sit for many minutes in silence. Early Quakers rejected instruments, and some meetings still don't have them, but today many do. There may be a short sermon, but in other meetings there is none. Methodists today have a bit more variety. There are certainly congregations that look quite a bit like the Anglican style. Ministers may wear special clothing, they follow the calendar, and use the organ. However, even more than the Anglicans, there are more exceptions where many Methodists have what is called a more low church style that is not very liturgical. There may be praise bands and digital pianos instead of the organ. In some cases, there's just praise music and no more hymnals. It's a case-by-case -case thing because Methodist churches today can have quite different styles from each other. The role of the ministry is another area that these traditions have differences. In the Anglican Church, they believe in apostolic succession. They claim that their bishops have been ordained in a line back to the apostles. The bishops are in a hierarchical structure with the Archbishop of Canterbury at the top. They also have priests and deacons. For Mennonites, they too have had a three-tier structure most often, with bishops, ministers, and deacons. Some in more recent decades have trended away from having bishops, however. Where the term is used, it may refer to an office which has oversight over multiple congregations, but in other cases it just refers to the senior pastor, or leading minister within a congregation. Quakers generally have rejected the idea of a distinction between clergy and laypersons, and many Quaker meetings don't have particular pastors or elders. Quakers don't do ordination in the way of the church credentialing someone, but in some cases they will recognize what they see that God has done. This is often referred to as a person being recorded as a minister. For Methodists, the ministry may be an Episcopal structure with bishops above ministers, but some Methodist denominations don't have bishops, and some are congregationally run. They don't hold to an apostolic succession view, and John Wesley's move to create bishops in America was one thing that led to problems between Methodists and Anglicans. On women in ministry, Anglicans have, in the last 60 years or so, swung from not allowing them as priests to, in the great majority of cases, allowing it. There are still quite a few provinces that don't allow women as bishops, but the big names, the Church of England and the Episcopal Church, both allow it. Conservative Mennonites in many cases restrict the ministerial roles to men only, but on the more moderate and liberal side, like in the Mennonite Church USA, women are allowed in all roles. Quakers have historically always allowed women to do everything a man could do in the church, and for Methodists, most have allowed women in all levels of ministry for quite some time now. What are some other distinguishing marks of these denominations? For Methodists, John Wesley taught that a person could be made perfect in love in this life, a view called entire sanctification or Christian perfection. This view, generally rejected by Anglicans, also gained prominence among the Quakers, who will often affirm it. Mennonites don't accept this view. Mennonites and Quakers share a category of being peace churches. That is, that both have historically had an emphasis of being opposed to participation in war and violence. The Mennonite view is traditionally that of non-resistance. If being attacked, they will not resist, nor will they take up arms and fight. Quakers have typically held to a pacifist view and will not go to war. Neither Anglicans nor Methodists have traditionally held these views. On salvation, Methodists have often emphasized the need for a conversion experience, while Anglicans tend to reject the idea believing that baptism is the beginning of a person's salvation, which is nurtured through these sacraments and is a lifelong process. Mennonites have, as Anabaptists, emphasized this moment of saving faith and put it as a prerequisite for baptism, and Quakers have had varying views on this point, with some holding to experiences of salvation and others not. Some Quakers have very different views on salvation altogether, with some being universalists, others viewing man as basically good, and so forth. There's quite a variety of views on salvation here. 
One thing that Anglicans, Mennonites, Quakers, and Methodists have all tended to agree on is the possibility of apostasy, or general rejection of the once saved, always saved viewpoint. Conservative Mennonites, of course, have some other views that aren't commonly seen in the other groups. Plain dress and women wearing head coverings is one, though there are a small number of plain dressing Quakers too, and many Mennonites today also don't wear plain dress. Some conservative Mennonites generally eschew careers, instead having their members work in their own communities, often as farmers or in other manual trades or owning their own businesses. One of the more divisive issues among these denominations today is that of same-sex marriage and acceptance of the LGBT movement in the church. For Anglicans, the Church of England does not allow same-sex marriage or practicing gay clergy, but the Episcopal Church in the U.S. does. For Mennonites, conservative Mennonites don't do gay marriage, but some conferences in the more liberal denomination in the U.S., the Mennonite Church USA, do allow it. Watch my Men in Exit video for more about that. Evangelical Quakers are opposed to same-sex marriage, but many of the other Quakers allow it. And for Methodists, the Methodist Church in Great Britain allows same-sex marriage, and the United Methodist Church, the largest U.S. Methodist denomination, which also has a large international presence, is dividing over this issue, with the Global Methodist Church just launched splitting from them. After things settle down within the next five or ten years, there's likely going to be at least these two groups, one of which allows same-sex marriage and one that doesn't. There's many other issues that we could discuss, but this is a good start. I have videos on all these denominations on this channel, so check those out. Click here for a video on most asked questions about Quakers. Subscribe for more videos on Christian denominations.